open up with me to Acts chapter 1. We'll continue. I think I will start at verse 1 again just to keep in context again, which we'd uh, looked at. But Acts, book of Acts chapter 1, we'll probably go to actually stop at the verse Dave looked at today. So, But let's begin in verse 1 there. <clears throat> in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given command through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise from the Father, which he said, you heard from me, uh, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus, as Dave said this morning, this same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Hmm. So that's as far as we'll go today. And probably cover more verses here in future, but um, let's start back at verse 6 again. Uh, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They asked him, and apparently, uh, I was uh, listening to some Greek guy on this verse, that it's in the imperfect tense, meaning they asked him over and over <laughs> and over again, Lord, is it this time? Are you gonna, is this going to happen now? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? And uh, I, 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 you can't blame them really for saying this because they were told, Jesus told them you'd sit on the 12 tribes, uh, t- thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and so on. Um, but so they're asking him this, uh, is this going to take place now? And you remember their questions before, who's going to sit on your right hand? Can I sit on your right hand? Somebody, my brother sit on your left, or his mother was asking, you know, my children sit there in places of authority with you as you rule and reign. And then the disciples even got, tried to up, uh, one up one another, well, who's going to be the greatest? And they begin to argue who's going to be greatest in this kingdom. <laughs> and so that, there were some some issues that needed to be dealt with for sure. But if you hold your finger there and go to Luke, again, who ties these scriptures here together and wrote the Gospel of Luke as well as Acts, uh, we talked about last year, but uh, last week. But Luke 19, 11, I keep your finger there in Acts, we'll continue to come back. Um, as they heard these things, and uh, um, He proceeded to tell this parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So you see, this is their thinking. They're going to Jerusalem. Oh, this is the big event. Jesus is culminating his life. Yeah, he talked about suffering and dying and going to the cross and stuff, but that just went right over their heads. (laughs) Just went right over it. And this is it. This is the big one. He's going to march into Jerusalem. And he says, they, they supposed that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So he's, he said to them, uh, he said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country and received for himself a kingdom and then returned. So he's telling them more about the kingdom of heaven, what it's like. It's going to be like this. It's not coming immediately. He's going to, re, uh, he's going to be leaving and, 
and then you'll come back, and so on. So I think he's trying to set the stage for it. Uh, those disciples on the way to Emmaus, remember what they said too? We, uh, in, in Luke 24, 21, he says, but we were hoping that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Our hopes are, but he's dead now, he's gone. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, this is the third day since it happened. Some women thought they heard he was alive, but him they didn't see, and their hopes are dashed. They're walking home sad. They went to this religious festival, and they're going home empty, sad. And then Jesus comes near them and walks with them. And then begins to reveal him in the scriptures to them. They had an understanding. And even as they're talking, do you ever have that happen where you're, didn't our, they said to each other after they realized it was Jesus later on, they said, didn't our hearts just burn within us as he opened to our, us the scriptures? Do you ever have that happen? It happens on occasion to me where it's just, I grasp something I never saw before. And it's like, it is like that. Uh, something burning within us. Wow, this is, this is God revealing something to me. And, uh, but they, their hopes were dashed because they had the, we were hoping he would redeem Israel at this time. We came to Jerusalem, we thought we were gonna be a part of this thing. You know, and watch him tear down the Romans and this is gonna be it. But it didn't come that way. And he even said in another place, and I think it's a different aspect of it, but he began to say to the, you know, the, the kingdom of God doesn't come by observation. <laughs> it's within you to the Pharisees and different ones there. But anyway, well, uh, so this was the expectation. I mean, you put it together. Jesus rose from the dead. They see him alive. He's been spending 40 days with them here and there, you know, coming into their midst and then taking off and coming back. And while well, they're fishing, they find him by the shore and eat breakfast with him. He gives them the great commission again. And so they saw his resurrected body. They think, oh, is it gonna happen now? He's talking about the Holy Spirit coming while well, doesn't Joel say that in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on flesh and, and this is gonna happen. And so they're putting two to two together. They're starting to say, well, this, this might be it. Jesus, are you gonna restore the kingdom at this time? And his answer was a little bit shocking to them, surprising perhaps, contrary to maybe all the buildup that they had in their own minds in verse seven of Acts chapter one. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's not for you to know the times and seasons. Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, but concerning the day and the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Concerning the day and the hour, nobody knows. And yet, isn't it funny that there have been people throughout history and still of our day trying to predict the day that Jesus is coming back. They've done it. Jehovah Witnesses have done it. Uh, and, and, and the way they just, oh, we made a mistake in our calculations. They pick another day that Jesus is coming back. They come to that and they just, some of them come to the conclusion, well, he came spiritually. He really did come, but he came in spirit. No. Sorry, nobody knows yet. And, and yet, why are so many people taken up with that? The exact day, the time. He, he's so clear on this. Don't, don't let this be what your focal point is. It's not for you to know this. He, he did want us to know that the last days are here. He did want us to know the general. He said, when you see the fig tree and these leaves and so on, start to know that, the, you know that he's near, he's at the door. So there are general things that we look for. And you know, the coming of Christ and his coming again ought to be something that stirs the way we live, ought to affect the way you and I live our life, should it not? You see that throughout scripture in different places when he talks about his return and, and judgment day coming and different things. He says, what kind of people ought we to live? How do we live then? Shouldn't we live a pure life? If he could come back, the church lived with the expectation that he's coming back in our time. Paul said that. And we who are alive will remain. He expected he'd be alive when Jesus came back. He knew this was gonna happen, but it helped them live a life for God. Help, help them live a pure life. It doesn't mean they didn't just go out and live any old way. He's returning. We should be found as, in another place that says, occupying till he comes. Be busy about his business until he comes. And so it's not for you to know these things. 
uh, the times and the seasons. You have a mission. You have a mission. Jesus gave us a task. He gave us a task instead of a timeline, didn't he? Somebody came up to us, and maybe you heard, but I said, I'm an eschatologist. Okay? I'm an, I, I do the study on the last days. That's, that's what I am. That's who I am as a person. I, I study the last days. And that's the only focus. Forget about the task of getting the gospel out of the world. I want to know whether the Antichrist has no hair, red hair. What kind of, you know. You ever heard people, I have some weird people out there with weird interpretations of things. And so taken up with this. You can't, have, you can't strike a conversation about other things in the scriptures with them without them going right back to this. Always wanting to learn something new that nobody else knows out there. And taken up with times and seasons. But what about the task he gave us to do? It's, that's like completely ignored. And it seems to me this is what he's getting the disciples at. Listen, it's not for you to know these things. You've just been given a commission. You've just been given a report of what, what to do. Something the, the, to focus on. But to say I'm an eschatologist and, and talk about end times and that be your focus only to the exclusion of all everything else Jesus gave us, commanded us to do, then that's not good. But the, the second coming of Christ ought to fuel <laughs> fuel the mission we're called to do, shouldn't it? And this gospel, again, it goes back to Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then there's the end come. Don't you get the idea that this is, I think my dad read a book when he was going to start out mission, and bring back the king. Well, how do we bring him back? Spread the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hastening, I read that this week, and I thought, could that mean what it means by looking for and hastening, hastening? The coming of the Lord? Is that possible? Knowing that Jesus' coming is a great motivation to live a pure life and to get about the work he called us to do. And then verse 8, which is really the key verse to the whole of Acts. This verse that we're going to look at right now is key to the rest of, of the book. And it's kind of an outline you'll find out as we go through the book. And this is it. So he says, you know, it's not for you to know the times and the season. The Father has that fixed. It's fixed. Nobody's going to change that. It's going to happen when the Father's ready for it to happen. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's my focus. There's your focus. That's what I want you as disciples to to focus on. I mean, Jesus in a few seconds is about ready to leave. He's about to take up and this is what he says to him right before he does. He ascends into heaven. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And this, this commission, or I don't know what else to call it here, that's in front of us involves three things, really. It involves a person. It involves power. And it involves a program. The person. Who's the person? Can anybody guess? It, he's involved. But who specifically, more specifically? Jesus. Jesus, he is right. He's the person. I mean, whose witnesses are we? Of what are we witnessing? Of what are they witnessing? It's a person, right? It's not a list of rules and a, a religion that they have out there. It's a person. I never forget that. This is... This is all about Jesus. It's about a Savior. Being His witnesses. Uh, Jesus is the one who has authority over the church. And uh, He's the object of, of what we give witness to. The power is the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit, which is absolutely necessary to accomplish His mission. And then the program, He says, it's going to begin in Jerusalem. And you'll see the outline. I'll just give you the verses, uh, chapters, chapter two through eight, or the beginning of eight, just to verse three, but is, is where you find the Jerusalem part of it. And it moves into all Judea and Samaria. And from that, you got chapter eight to chapter 12. And then it moves across many boundaries and all the way to the, the imperial capital of Rome at that time, 
with Paul, we find out in, in Romans anyway, the end, having plans still to go to Spain. And so to the ends of the earth, that's probably chapters 12 to the end of the book. That's kind of the geographical outline it's giving us of the book of Acts. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And these were Jesus' final words. This is his plan. The, the early church was a missionary-minded church, weren't they? Dave showed where a lot of the apostles or disciples ended up in different countries, different places. And so I'm encouraged by, by the fact that this church supports missions and missionaries and, and Adriana's trip and Christine's trip that she, uh, they had last year to Japan. And this church, it's no secret, it's written downstairs. We had the annual meeting too, gave uh, $88,000 this past year, $88,604 to mission, just the church. That's not counting your individual, I know some of you give to missions outside of this, they do it from your home. And I thought, you know, this is why, is this, this not the focus of what it's about? Investing in the kingdom in these ways, getting involved, this, is this still the mission of the church today, or is, has God changed his mission a little bit? Uh, we're just supposed to sit in here and seclude ourselves and talk about Jesus, and then go to work and don't tell anybody about Jesus, and we'll come back next Sunday, and then we'll talk about him again. That's not the idea, do we? Have? Do we think anything's changed in our day? It shouldn't. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We can't do it without us. We cannot do this work in the flesh. Uh, as my dad always used to say something that stuck with me. And that was, he says, I want to be involved in things that walk the streets of gold. In other words, he, he wanted to be involved with eternal things, things that last forever. Because if it's in the flesh, it won't go anywhere. The church isn't some kind of a a machinery that just, you, you, you get the thing rolling a little bit like this and then it runs on its own, you know. <laughs> we need God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6 says, and even in the Old Testament, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What is he talking about there? It's not by man's power. It's not by man's uh, might, but it's God's spirit. The disciples, not too long after this, will find out, are facing persecution. They hadn't been in this very long, sharing the gospel, and all of a sudden they start to get some opposition and persecution and beatings. What do they do? <laughs> they run to a prayer meeting. And they didn't pray for safety, they prayed for boldness. They got together and said, Ah, we need boldness. They, they didn't get together and discuss, should we continue with this mission? Should we, and it's dangerous right now. Should we continue? In fact, they forbid him. I forbid you now to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. Well, they go back to a prayer meeting, discuss this a little bit. What should we do? Let's pray for boldness. We're just going to take some boldness now. And they go to a prayer meeting and they pray for boldness. And God gives them boldness to carry out the work he'd called them to do. Supernatural boldness to accomplish this. When things get tough, what do we do? Go to a prayer meeting, <laughs> right? Isn't this what we're supposed to do? Or when things get tough, ah man, things are rotten in this world. This world's going to hell. A handbasket, and there's nothing we can do about it except complain. And every time you talk to that person, it's always the same. Look at the political situation around. Isn't a mess? Oh, I hate this world. It's on. What did that accomplish? What's that do for anybody? <laughs> nothing. God still does the same. This ought to drive us to prayer. When we run into opposition, trouble preaching the gospel, it ought to drive us to prayer. God, we need you. Here's the opposition that's facing us. What do we do? God, help us. Give us boldness. We need boldness right now. Did God give him boldness? Oh, man, you see Peter stand up and boldly proclaim. 
with the gospel. And then I'd drive us to prayer. God's plan is still the same, isn't it? St. Chronicles 714, if my people were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, heal their land, forgive their sins and heal their land. I think his program's still the same. Instead of complaining about it, why don't we spend some more time praying about it? And sharing the gospel, doing the mission we're called to do. That's what's gonna change things. We need to get with God's program and God says, I'll accomplish it by my spirit, why? So that when it's all said and done, who gets the glory? He does. Because no flesh will ever glory in his presence. Don't you think there's somebody in heaven going to be bragging someday that they really did God's work? The Apostle Paul is not going to be a, No flesh is going to glory in his presence. He's going to get the credit. It's all of him. It's all of grace. And Bruce emphasized that, I think, at the beginning of our time. We don't have to. The response isn't up to us. God does the work. We take no credit for it. And so we give witness to this. We need this power, but it's, it's a power to witness, to share the gospel. You know, we don't talk about Jesus and the whole thing isn't a legend or a myth. And Paul, Peter even had to tell the people of his day that in 2 Peter 1.16, Shelley and I were reading this week, it says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What we're telling you about, we saw. We saw we were on the Mount of Transfiguration there when it scared the wits out of us. When Jesus, the Jesus we knew as just a man, all of a sudden turned so bright we couldn't look on him. And then this guy named Moses and Elijah who've been dead for years appear with Jesus and they have a discussion. We were eyewitnesses of that. Don't tell, think we're telling you some myths or some legends that are just hanging out there. Why would you, nobody would die for a myth. Peter died on a cross upside down because he didn't think he was worthy to die like Christ. So he asked to have it, his cross when he died turned upside down. That's what, but they wouldn't, nobody would die for a myth or a legend or truth, but he was an eyewitness. He saw it with his own eyes, the living Christ. And this is what we witness. We give witness to a person. Was it, doesn't it tell us that? That after we're saved, we're supposed to give, uh, how does it say, transform from darkness to light? And that we give testimony, I don't know, now it's falling away from my mind, but something about the excellencies of his name. Anyway, I can't think of it. Maybe it'll come back to me. Uh, anyway, okay. But we, we proclaim him. It's a person that we do. Um, and John said that. I, I, we're probably familiar with this, but I think it's worth repeating. First John 1. 1 through 3, he says, That which, we, uh, which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and what we've looked upon and we've touched with our hands concerning this word of life, the life that was manifest, and we have seen it and testify to you and, uh, to you and proclaim it, proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you might have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. He says, this, we're, we're eyewitnesses, John says. We're just passing along facts about him too. This is real. You know, this would be the worst job if this, I would be wasting my time here and so are you guys if none of this is real. We're just deluded people. But boy, I've experienced God too much. I know him. And these things are real. And to be involved in his purpose and his privilege is the greatest honor on earth. I've told you, I've had a cousin who works in the White House. And that was considered an honor for I don't know how many presidents. And oh man, he, Ron, works in the White House. Wow, wow. I work for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I get to be about his business. I get to be his ambassador. Forget about being an ambassador of the United States, some country. That's an honor, it's a privilege, but not like this one. I get to tell people about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So do you. This is our mission, it's a person. And the mission, I'll tell you, he, he doesn't tell us it's an easy mission. He tells us it's gonna be difficult. 
It's really an impossible mission without God. First Corinthians, here's how our message is going to be received. Paul goes right to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.23 and he says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Not a popular message. In chapter 1 and verse 23, or in verse 18, he said, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. It's folly. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Not a popular message. In that day, you were looked, and, and not our day too, but in their day, it was looked as foolishness because the philosophy of the day was that the powerful use their power to destroy. You, you're strong, you're, you're going to destroy things. You're going to enslave, you're going to punish. It would be normal for the Almighty then to come and destroy everything that was opposed to him. Right? That's power. The one who shows mercy in those days, they considered a fool. And so it's foolishness to love your enemies. What? Love your enemies? Show them mercy. It's a, it's a hard gospel. People aren't going to, there are going to be many that think you're, the message is foolishness. But guess what? The church grew. The gospel went forward, the church grew because it's the power of God to salvation. We have a message. People who are living in deceit and darkness, but the Holy Spirit comes through the word and destroys the darkness and the lies. And that same power that has the power to destroy the lies we believe makes us into new creatures in Christ. He takes these depraved minds and renews them and makes us, gives us new hearts, new minds, to think differently. That's what Slavi talked about last week, didn't he? Renewing our minds, or two weeks ago. Renewing our minds. And many of you, this has happened to you. You know what I'm talking about, didn't you? You told me about your past and how you maybe thought Christians were the biggest fools. But now you are one. <laughs> now you're a fool, now you get to be a fool for Christ. You know what Paul said? Hmm. And so the church has a job, don't we? It, it's not political reform. It's not, uh, our focus is not to go out and try to change the laws around us. I, I don't find it anywhere in scripture, but our focus is to preach the gospel. And as you preach the gospel, and this is to be the mission of the church, when people are converted, guess what? It changes families. It changes communities. It changes laws. And our focus is the gospel. I'm not saying don't get involved in politics. Some people are called to that too, and whatever it is, and we should say, but the focus has always been the gospel. This is what transforms. You can change laws and not change people's hearts. Because the heart is the thing that needs to be changed first. And then now let's go back to verse 9 there in the story here. That being the key verse, but verse 9 begins. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Cloud took him out of their sight. You know, this isn't the first time in the Bible that happened. Or a cloud, even in Exodus, you see in Exodus 40 verse 34, then a cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. There's always been a symbol of the, of the presence of God when God would come. And people would see that. And it was a, a, a sign, even to Moses, the burning bush. What was that? It was a manifestation of the glory of God. The presence of God was there. Now you're on holy ground. Take off your sandals. And at the transfiguration in Matthew 17, 5, it says that he was still speaking to them when behold, a bright, bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came from the cloud, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. And so the cloud comes and takes him up into heaven. What an unforgettable sight though, huh? I'd never forget that if I saw that. In verse 10, and while they were gazing into heaven, 
as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. They're awestruck, they're looking by, and two angels appearing to them as men. They, they, were, they were angels all the time, weren't they? At, at his birth, there were angels and the glory of the Lord shone around them. There was that. There was at Jesus' temptation, angels came and attended. At the tomb, there were angels, and now at his ascension, the angels are there, and they, they come with a question and a message in verse 11. And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, as Dave said, this Jesus whom you love, this Jesus who you know and love, who is taken up from you into heaven. Where is he? He's in heaven. Will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. But they asked this. I thought it was a funny question, isn't it? Why are you looking into heaven? Uh, duh, I just saw Jesus leave. You know, I, I, but you know, I think it stirs something in it. What are you guys still doing looking into heaven? You think he's, you think he's going to come back in a couple of minutes? Or? I, you know, this Jesus, the one you love, he's going to come the same way you saw him go. I think if they hadn't seen the ascension, they would be wondering if he's coming still for another visit. Why? Because during those 40 days, he just appeared to them time, from time to time. Many proofs. But seeing the ascension, no, no he, he, he went back into heaven. Remember his prayer in John 17? Lord, I'm, I'm finished the work you gave me to do. I'm going to return to the glory that I had with you before the world was made. Talked about it. They probably put two and two together. Oh, there he goes. He goes out. He's not coming back for little visits here to eat breakfast with us in that same way. This same Jesus, he's, he's coming back though. He is coming back, but I've got a mission for you. And he will come personally and he will come visibly. Not spiritually. <laughs> he's coming personally and visibly. Mark 14, 61 and 62. But he remained silent and made no answer when, when he was held there and arrested Jesus. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said to him, I am. I am. And you will see the son of man seated on the right hand of, the pow of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You're going to see it someday. Every eye will behold him. It's not going to be look here, look there. As the kingdom of Jesus said earlier in another place, when people say they don't believe him, It'll come like lightning. We had a good storm this morning, didn't we? You could see the lightning. You could hear the thunder. In the same way, it's not going to be some secret thing. Everybody's going to know Jesus is back. The angel said, why are you looking into heaven? Jesus told you, just told you what he wanted you to do. Don't stand here waiting for his return. Don't stand here doing nothing. Don't stand here speculating uh, the times and seasons. Let's get back to work. Let's get back to work. He'll be back. Let's get with the program. The descended living Jesus directs his church from heaven and will one day return and co to consummate all that he began. John 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is, not, it is to your advantage that I go away. This is, what, this is when he went away, people. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is when Jesus said, I'm going in my Father's house or many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you might be also. I'm coming back. So when he says here, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but I will go. But if I go, I will send him to you. And this is now the anticipation that they're waiting for. Jesus is in heaven working out his will on earth in the power of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. Jesus continues his work on earth through people, guess what? Like Dave said, just people like you and me. What? You mean I get to do this? I get to do God Almighty, the one who made the heavens and the earth. I get to be involved in his work. 
Yes, you do. That's what I like about, I just, the verse 11 struck me this week. I guess I never, the angels said, men of Galilee. Who are the men of Galilee? Galileans were despised. They had an accent, like Terry's ha dad haunts you. Know? Anybody else here have accents? Anyway, some of you do. Boston. But, you know, they, they were despised, but, but I love the way he approached men of Galilee. And it's unlikely people. They were unlikely. Would you choose the down and out to be the one to carry on your work when you're gone? Would you have chosen Peter, who just denied you that he knew you three times right before your crucifixion? Would you then go choose him to be a pastor? Jesus did. Do you ever feel like a failure? Do you ever feel like, God, I, you can't use me. Who am I? Just ordinary people, fishermen, tax collectors, ordinary people. Don't look at the Bible and say, oh, look at those super, super saints or whatever. They were men of like passions like you and I. They were no different than you or me. And so I'd say this morning, men and women, children, young people here of Swanton, Highgate, St. Armand, St. Albans, <laughs> and wherever you come from, why do you stand here waiting? Why do we stand here doing maybe now, our focus needs to be adjusted this morning. Why are you standing here? Be about my business, I, the business I've called you to. You know, my brother Mike used this illustration on 9-11, and everybody remembers 9-11, don't you? When there's a fire, when there's a fire in a building, you run out, right? That's normal. When the heat's turned up and things are not going right, it's natural to run from fire. But you see policemen, you see firemen going into a burning building. Why? That was their mission. They were called to that. They prepared for this. They went into burning buildings. And we know that when the building crashed, many of them lost their lives. But many of them were used as rescue lives in there, weren't they? Many were rescued before the building came. You say, maybe we're called to, to, are we called when things are heated up in society? And are we called to run into the fire? You bet. They did what they were commissioned to do. They did their job. They, some gave up their life. Does that mean we might give up? Yes, we might give up our lives. Many in this book gave up their life for the mission. So I'm not making light of the fact that we may run into some trouble. We might be killed for it. But what a privilege to rescue one here, rescue one there. It was worth Jesus dying for. Didn't he save you? Didn't he rescue you? Now he says, go out and rescue others. Pull them from the burning. Luke's account of this, and I'll be done with this. Luke's account, if you want to turn to Luke 24. We looked at it last week. He's telling them the wait in Jerusalem. But I want to show you with what kind of attitude they left that mountain with. And I hope this can be our attitude. And I pray if it's not, that God would change it to be like theirs. Luke 24, verse 49. And behold, I'm sending you the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. This has given us more more a picture into what happened there. He didn't just get in a cloud and nope, be out on another site, wait. He blessed them. I like reading that. Jesus is blessing these men of Galilee, these women and men and everybody who was there. While he blessed them, he parted from them. 
and was carried up into heaven. And what did they do? And they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple blessing God. Well, what are, well, I read this this week, I think. What should our attitude now be as we get to carry out this gospel? Where's that great joy? The joy of the Lord. No, that's one Tony's thing. What Tony's thing about joy? I got joy like a fountain. I admit, sometimes I don't. Love like an ocean? No, I don't sometimes. I'll be honest. But I want this joy. I want, <laughs> we've been commissioned to something. It's going to be hard, but we have the power. He's clothed us with power from on high to go out and give a message that's foolish to some, but it's going to rescue somebody from hell. Somebody's not going to be in hell because you shared the gospel because God's going to do a work. This is our business. And this is what we should focus on. And there's no reason that then we can't continue those things. We've been blessed by him. Worship him. Until he comes back, worship him. How much time do you, do you spend any time just in adoration of him? Worship him. Bless him. And they went back to Jerusalem with great joy. Wow, this, there's some things going to happen here. We're excited. And I'm excited for Adriana going. We were excited last year for Christine and them going to Japan and praying for her. This is it. Young people get involved in the things of eternal God. Young people, I know many of you kids, fanning out tracks here in the park and you're doing it on your own and, and doing things like that. This is it. This is talking to people about God, sharing the gospel. This is it. We, we were involved in it one way or another. Invest in it. Your money in it. Um, we know the mission. We got it. We can pray, right? Pray. We can give. We can go. Invest in it. Share the gospel. And this ought to give us great joy as we do it. Even when they were persecuted, they left with joy. The joy of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's what gives it to us too as well. But we're giving testimony to a person. It's a person. Never forget that. We're, we're his witnesses. We're giving testimony about a person, not a religion. I remember that, hearing that story when my, my grandpa was the first one to come to Christ in all our relationship. And grandpa helped his dad, who was a bartender and owned the bar in Milwaukee. And when grandpa, my grandpa got saved, he went to his own dad to plead with him. He was shaving in his bathroom. And grandpa Brechner, got, my grandpa, got on his knees. Pled with his dad to get right with God. Plan with him. He was angry. <laughs> I don't need this religion. He pled with these. This is not religion, Dad. This is about a living person, Christ, who lives in me and can live in you. He was angry because he saw all these church people come to church. Sunday, he said they they leave Saturday night or Sunday morning, go to church all dressed up. And then they'd come in his bar and he'd hear their filthy talk and the, the, just knew the way people lived and yet they dressed up and he said, I don't want anything to do with his hypocrisy. That's why I don't want to do anything with God. But after a while, my great grandpa developed gangrene in his foot and couldn't stand to attend bar anymore. Grandpa got saved. He said, I'm not going to attend bar anymore for you. I'm, I refuse to play my instrument in your bar. I kind of started a riff in the family. And then this brother, other brother, got saved. And he quit playing in the bars. And he quit attending. Finally, great-grandpa had to sell the bar. He didn't have enough help. And this was during the Great Depression. Drinking was still good. Business. He was a smart businessman. He made a lot of money during the Depression. It was enough to buy a house when he sold the bar. Sold the bar. And, and then decided he was going to uh, buy the house and then grandma by this time his, his uh, uh, my great grandma would had come to know Christ 
And uh, she wanted to dedica dedicate the house to God. And Grandpa said, yeah, I'll do it, but uh, Dad has to agree to it. So they got him, he said, Dad, what? he says, as long as I don't have to do anything, it's fine, you can have a dedication of the house. And uh, Grandpa said, I, okay. My grandpa told him, Dad, all you have to do is say amen after I pray. Oh, that's easy enough, so he did. And then they had a song and he went to his room. But I think it was that night, he had a dream, that they, the song that they were singing that night. In his dream, he heard that song. He, was, he was, saw himself as, and I think it was the song, I'm, arm in, I'm walking arm in arm with Jesus. I don't know the song. But that was a song they were singing that day. And in his dream, he saw that. And then he, he began to kick the devil out of bed, in his own words. He just uh, woke up and kind of had that, knew the devil had to get out of his life, so he started kicking. His wife said, what are you doing? He said, I'm kicking the devil out of bed. Well, she was offended, because as far as she knew, she was the only one in bed. <laughs> but he woke up a new man. As his custom was, he sold his bar, so he had to go somewhere else to drink. He, he went every morning for a drink, so he went to the first bar where he'd gone often, bought some beer, sat down, and didn't taste right. He told the bartender, he said, uh, give me another one. They give him another one. He said, it didn't taste right. He said, you must have got a bad shipment. So he went to the next bar, did the same thing. Same thing happened. He was on his way into the third bar, when God spoke to him and said, do you remember what happened to you last time? You don't need this anymore. You don't need this. My grandpa never touched another drink to the day he died. Alcoholic to that day. Now he started going around town with a big Bible. The chief of police that used to, of Milwaukee was his, attended his bar. The, the mayor of northern Milwaukee attended his bar, so he thought it now it was his duty to go share the gospel with these guys. So big Bible under his arm, he went to the chief of police house. I used to sell you a drink. He said, now I'll sell you something that doesn't cost you anything. He witnessed. Time came, I really didn't plan on telling any of this, but, but then, then he developed that, that gangrene in his leg again, and they, they had to amputate it. And everybody was a little worried, all the family, the Christians now, that he finally just gave his life to Christ. He's living for God, but now they're going to take his leg. Is he going to be bitter at God and say, you know, what's this Christianity? I give my life to God and they have to do this. So all the family's kind of worried and praying for him and so on. He comes out of uh, anesthesia and comes to and realizes his leg was gone. They told him, your leg is gone. The first words out of his mouth were, praise the Lord. He said, praise the Lord, the devil got my leg, but Jesus got my heart. This is what changes an area. This is what changes families. Not a religion. When Grandpa knelt before him and pleaded with him to get right, he said, I don't need your religion. This isn't religion, this is a person. This is a living person, Jesus Christ. And this is what it's about. This is what we're witnesses do, right? To, the, to share the excellences of him, of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, the excellencies of Jesus. There's a lot of them. Can I tell you about some? Another time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you today for your word. Oh, Lord, we cannot do this task in our own strength. We come up with the best plans that man can possibly do to get your work done. We need your power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you said be filled with the Spirit, be being filled. So fill us, Lord, and use us for your purposes. We won't, don't attempt this in the flesh, for that would be futile. But, oh God, we need you, how we need you. And so we come in prayer right now, asking you that you help us do this work. Help us to fulfill the task that you've given to us to this church. Somehow, however we can be involved in it, Lord, help us. And we give you the glory and the credit for it all. And let this be a successful week. Lord, we pray that this would be a, a bad week for the devil. It would be a good week for you and your kingdom. Help us, Lord. And when we run into trouble, let's call on one another to pray for each other. 
and give us whatever is needed to proclaim, to finish the mission that you've given us to us. And so we ask that you bless Adriana. She prepares for this trip to supply all the needs, everything that's necessary, God. And as we go out this week and proclaim, give us opportunities, Lord. You always seem to open up doors here through our funeral last night, too. Or thank you for giving, Lord, yet, Lord, your word. Proclaim it boldly, despite how it might have been received by some, Lord. We thank you for, the, for helping her, for helping me, for just being with us. And so help us even this week to begin to be able to proclaim it to somebody else. To tell them this good news about Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for our salvation. We bless you. Help us to be worshipers of you. Help us to go out this week in the joy of the Lord. Rejoice in you always. All for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we're going to stand and sing another song here. In closing.